Hey everyone, uh, we're back, obviously, from our mid-season intermission. We spent October setting up our next moves for season two, and there are some really exciting announcements heading your way soon. We've also been listening to your responses on the little survey that we put on our website, and we're grateful for all of your feedback. I just wanted to highlight one response in particular. We asked how you felt about the amount of science we have on the show, and one listener wrote in, I like learning about ecology and how natural systems function, slash interrelationships that connect me more to plants, etc. I actually think quote-unquote science is a product of the Western capitalistic atomistic civilization that's murdering the planet and helps perpetuate a worldview of domination over and control of nature. So I'm pretty critical of that word. But facts about how things work, even from an imperfect perspective, are interesting and make me love wild nature even more. So I just wanted to say thank you for putting that so well. Uh, Our goal in making this show is to offer you a variety of perspectives which may change how you move through this world, because this world is changing, and we'll need to change with it. And on that note, about two weeks ago, halfway through our mid-season hiatus, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, dropped a 500-plus page report called Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees Celsius. If you missed it, that's fair. There's been a lot going on in the world. Uh, But this is important, and it hit us here at Future Ecologies like a ton of bricks. The report reads as sort of a roadmap of the possible futures that we could have depending on what we do from the present. And it's written primarily for policymakers and international leaders in mind. But we're going to take it also as a bit of a roadmap to guide our work here at Future Ecologies. And you'll be hearing more about that a little farther on down that road. For now, though, we hope you enjoy the second half of our first season and continue to tell your friends about it. We really appreciate it. Okay, so this is the poem that I wrote just days before the book went to the printer. And it was about a dream that I had. And the title of the poem is She Dreamed She Danced With Jellyfish. Amidst the swirling currents ride, strange jelly beings floating by, in reds and blues and brownish hues, far too many to classify. Long, stingy, stringy thingies, an eyeball on a tassel, with delicate pink tentacles belying its dreaded stinging hassle. Bald men of war armadas use nothing but the breeze, like sentinels from other worlds, an odyssey o'er the seas. Wine-hued giant sea nettles, and silvery ones with purple stripes, and ghostly moons so splendid, a zillion different types. Twirling spheres and clapping lobes whose bodies catch the light, rows of flashing rainbows gleam, gifting me wild delight. And Irukandji thimbles, wicked tentacles long and fine, and as I reached to touch, the world shifted from brine to mine. the most amazing dream. All of these jellyfish that I love, that are part of my life, were all around me, and they were all like this parade of jellies. And I really did reach out to touch, and boom, that's when I woke up. You can't imagine it. You you can't imagine what stupid, filmy, brainless, spineless nothingness of jellyfish could possibly be doing that could affect us. You just can't imagine. 
If you've been tuning into the first half of our first season of Future Ecologies, then you'll probably recognize this poet laureate of Jellyfish as Dr. Lisa Ann Gershwin. I'm Dr. Lisa Ann Gershwin, and I work with Jellyfish. And it's kind of a funny way of introducing myself, because up until not very many years ago, whenever I would say I work with Jellyfish, the commonest response I got was, why? And now you say you work with jellyfish and people have questions. Oh, um, I, you know, have you heard of this one? Or, ooh, what about those stingy ones? Or, ooh, is it true that they really get that big? Or, you know, there's more recognition about jellyfish now. And Lisa's work has been one of the primary catalysts for what you might recognize as a, a real cultural zeitgeist of jellyfish. Over the course of her career, she's identified and described over 200 new species. Yeah, I'm at 217 at the moment, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and counting, you know, like it blows my mind. And if you're one of our Patreon supporters, then you'll have already been introduced to some of the many jellyfish Lisa has discovered and studied over the years. But today, instead of focusing on the individual species, we're going to zoom way out. We haven't strayed yet from dry land for most of this first season. That's because I get seasick. But as you all know, oceans make up the majority of this planet. And the oceans? Well, let's just say they've seen better days. If you were to ask me, you know, what do you worry about the most? What frightens you? For me, it's ocean acidification. Yeah, there is a garbage truck of plastic entering the ocean every minute of every hour of every day. Boaters and beachgoers are reporting an invasion of stinging critters up and down our coast. If, if we continue this way, in less than 40 years, we won't have any fish left. They not only pose a potential threat to local food chain, but they're driving fishermen mad. It is a dark picture, and I'm not a really pessimistic person. You know, I, I tend, actually, most people who know me would say that I'm pathologically optimistic, you know, like annoyingly optimistic, which is maybe why it came as a real shock to me that it's as bad as it is. And if we sat down and, like, if we whiteboarded by committee, all right, guys, how do we screw up the oceans? Come on, give me some ideas here. You know, let's, let's whiteboard this. How do we screw up the oceans? The things we would whiteboard are exactly the same things we're doing now. You know, if we wanted to make life perfect for jellyfish, if we wanted to destroy fish, the things we would whiteboard are the things we're doing exactly as we're doing. And what we're doing collectively in many parts of the ocean is creating ideal habitats for jellyfish. And they're having a renaissance, you know. But one of my colleagues described it as the golden age of gelata. And I love that. I just think that is such a perfect way of looking at the world. From the jellyfish's point of view, this is their time. The biggest problem jellies have ever had was, you know, those bony upstarts, fish. <laughs> And so as long as fish have been around, you know, jellies have just not had the high quality life. So, you know, I think now that fish are faltering, jellyfish are like, oh yeah, we're back, you know. <laughs> so, in this episode of Future Ecologies, we're going to ask two questions. First, are jellyfish populations expanding globally? And if so, why? And what does it mean? Wait, that's three questions. Broadcasting from Vancouver, British Columbia, on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, this is Future Ecologies. You know, you, you gotta kind of admire something that's been around for 500 million years, half a billion years, jellyfish have been around and they haven't really changed. And, you know, in that time, other things have, you know, evolved and gone extinct and, you know, some things have evolved and then, you know, sprouted feathers and wings and feet and legs and learned to breathe and jellyfish have just stayed the same this whole time while everything else has been going through all this change around them and jellyfish 
survived all these mass extinctions that have wiped out almost all life on Earth, and yet jellyfish haven't changed because they haven't had to, because what they do works. Before we tackle the big questions, let's talk a little bit about exactly what it is that jellyfish do. The first thing to know about jellyfish is that nobody can agree on exactly what jellyfish are. It's a polyphyletic group, which means that there are a number of different unrelated groupings of organisms that are commonly referred to as jellyfish. As opposed to finfish, which most of you will recognize as fish. Some of these groups resemble the common jellyfish that we all know and uh, love, but others are colonial organisms. That means they're actually made up of a bunch of little tiny individual organisms living together as one being, as one super colony. And still others are miniature vertebrates that are actually more closely related to humans than to other jellyfish. There's a huge diversity of of jellyfish out there. Um, There's probably about 3,000 species so far of things that have been named and, and loosely fall under that category of jellyfish. And there's probably tens of thousands of of more of these organisms that uh, have yet to be identified and and labeled according to science. So there's an equally wide uh, diversity of reproductive strategies. You know, some jellyfish spend their whole lives in the water column. Some jellyfish are are hermaphrodites. That's Dr. Lucas Bratz. He's also going to join us on this exploration of jellyfish. Sometimes they call me Dr. Jellyfish instead of Dr. Pepper. And I'm a Nidaria scientist with Quantitative Aquatics based at UBC's Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries. There is a stunning amount of diversity and variability within the jellyfish groups, which makes it nearly impossible to generalize. So we'll make one last plug for those of you who haven't tuned into our Patreon feed. That's where you can learn more about these different groups. For our purposes here, though, just to get a sense for what a somewhat typical jellyfish lifestyle is, we're going to take a brief tour through the Scyphozoan life cycle. The basic jellyfish life cycle is, it's very simple in a way, but it's like nothing we can relate to. There's sort of one life cycle that is used by many of the jellyfish that people are familiar with, the sort of more conspicuous pulsing medusa bell that that everyone knows about from from going to the beach. Um, They have a really fascinating life cycle. And so those adult uh, pulsing jellyfish, we we call those the medusae, they um, are usually around sort of summer to fall in in temperate environments. And they're... um, sexually dioecious so there there's boys and girls and they have eggs and sperm and they release those uh, into the water column when it's when it's reproductive time and so those eggs and sperm will, will fertilize in the water column some species sort of brood their larvae but for the most part um, the fertilized eggs develop very quickly into a little larva that we call a planula and that planula under a microscope just kind of looks like um I've heard it described as sort of a hairy tic-tac. They're funny little things. They're tiny, tiny little things that look like little miniature ciliated cigars. And so they're just these short, little, funny, little cigar-looking things. And they move around in these weird little spirals. And they just like do 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 in these little spirals. And sometimes they'll just stay in place and they'll just spiral around in place. And other times they'll actually swim in a corkscrew. They're just funny little things. And they're just trying to find a place to settle. And then once they settle, they kind of burrow their tail in. And well, actually, well, they burrow their head in. So the head of the planula is actually the tail. Anyway, they're weird. <laughs> So so they they burrow their little head in, like face first, but then that's actually the tail of the animal. So And then they settle in and they kind of cement themselves down with little sticky bits. And then the tail end now becomes the head end. I can't make heads or tails of this. <laughs> It'll attach itself to that hard substrate and then slowly uh, transform into a polyp. And these polyps, uh, these jellyfish polyps, are, are really quite small. Um, you can see them with the naked eye, but they're, they're really, really tiny. But when you look at them closely or you magnify them, they look like kind of a tiny coral polyp without the skeleton, of course, or a miniature sea anemone. And they just sit there as polyps, having their little tentacles out, 
grabbing little plankton and things, eating and growing and cloning and cloning and cloning and cloning. And I mean, they just clone lots of replicates of themselves. And polyps, these jellyfish polyps, can uh, exist on the ocean floor for uh, years. We, we don't actually have a good idea of how long. It might even be decades. So these colonies are really long-lived and super resilient. Lisa has determined that they can clone themselves in 13 different ways. 13 different ways. Come on, jellyfish are cool. (laughs) You've got to admire something that can clone in 13 different ways. When they start cloning a colony, so you get one larva that settles, right? It starts cloning a colony, and there's like a leading edge. So only the ones around the outside of the colony are actually cloning more replicates. The inside, they're just fattening up, waiting to make baby jellyfish. When an environmental trigger causes them to start reproducing again, um, typically this happens in the spring in temperate environments, they'll go through this fascinating process where they start asexually cloning themselves and dividing um, to make little tiny baby jellyfish. So when the conditions are right, these polyps that have fattened up undergo this process called strobilation. Each polyp goes through this metamorphosis where it elongates and differentiates into a stack of discs, like like a stack of coins or like a stack of dinner plates, little tiny dinner plates. And each of these aphirae, they're called, or baby jellyfish, becomes a little flower-looking creature, like a little daisy. And they have these eight little arms, and each arm has a little sense organ, and they have these four little lips in the inside, and they start pulsating, trying to break away, and they eventually do break away, and they look like these little flowers beating away in the water, and they're voraciously hungry, and they eat everything they can get their lips around. So because they're small, they can only eat small stuff, but, you know, they eat fish eggs and sometimes fish larvae and plankton that the larvae would eat and they grow very very fast Um, they can go from just a couple of millimeters which is like a tenth of an inch um, to dinner plate size in just a couple months and they can feed and grow very rapidly and 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 grow into the medusa um, that we started the story with and so it's a really fascinating life cycle with many stages Uh, not necessarily one after the other, but they can kind of exist in in different stages within a population at the same time. Um, So after those polyps go through that process, the polyp doesn't necessarily die. They can stick around. But it's fascinating to me that these species have both sexual and asexual reproduction within uh, the same life cycle. It's, It's probably one of the secrets of their success. And here we are, back again to the Medusa that we're all familiar with that can put out either sperm or eggs and begin the cycle all over again. But Lucas pointed out something key. All of these life stages can coexist in a population in a given area. And it's actually the polyp stage, not the medusa stage, that really maintains the population. The medusa is actually more of a dispersal mechanism, really, for the polyps, which can happily subsist out of sight, tucked away somewhere, for years and years, waiting for the right conditions to strobilate. I feel like I've been to a party like that. And when those conditions arrive, boom, you've got a whole smack of jellyfish. Smack being the actual official name for a big herd, so to speak, of jellyfish. The collective noun is smack? The collective noun is smack. Oh my god. Whoa. So, uh... (laughs) How did I just learn that? You learned something during the recording of Future Ecologies, Mendel. Wow. So, just as a sidebar, I think it's, it's really neat that This jellyfish life cycle actually mirrors what happens in fungi, in in mushrooms, where a mushroom is this ephemeral thing that just pops up when the fungus wants to reproduce itself in the same way that a polyp bed will produce medusae in order to generate more polyps. What's really happening in mushrooms is that there's this mycelium that lives on for years and years. There is this part that nobody ever sees. It's small and inconspicuous and under things and... We just have no idea that it's there. It's completely off our radar. And that's the true fungus. And the mushroom is just this once in a while fruit. And I think it's kind of, it's kind of neat to reimagine jellyfish as just this vehicle for reproduction. And then when the conditions are right, poof, you get all these mushrooms or all these jellyfish. Also like fungi, 
Jellyfish have huge but largely unnoticed effects on their ecosystem. We'll talk about those after the break. So some of you have been wondering why we have these breaks since we don't run advertisements. And the answer is because we feel like it. And also for public service announcements like this one. In Canada and the United States in the next two weeks, it's time to practice democracy. If you live in BC, we have a referendum coming up for proportional representation. Expect a ballot in the mail. Fill it out, send it in. By November 30th, preferably. And if you live in America, I think you know the drill. November 6th, midterm elections, get out there and vote. All right, is that it? (laughs) That's it. (laughs) Back to the show. So, many jellyfish have this unique life cycle that hasn't changed in hundreds of millions of years and has allowed them to survive multiple mass extinctions and the rise of much more complex organisms. They might not be the smartest or the fastest, but they may very well be the hardest to kill. And it's this cockroach-like quality that has been grabbing headlines over the past decade or so. As our ocean changes, the idea that jellyfish are ascendant has made its way into popular consciousness. But, much like the widespread notion that you can slowly boil frogs to death without them noticing, which I've never actually seen anyone do, and I would probably try to stop them if they tried. Don't boil frogs, that makes you a bad person. Anyway, We wanted to see if there's actually data that shows that jellyfish populations are expanding. Lucky for us, Lucas has been working on this very question. Right, so it's a very interesting question. Um, You know, usually my response to the question, are jellyfish increasing globally, is what do you mean by a jellyfish? What do you mean by an increase? What do you mean by global? And over what time frame? Because really, depending on how you define the terms of reference of the question, could lead you down the road of a different answer, whether it be a yes, no, or a maybe. But uh, I've spent a big part of my career sort of digging into that question, and, and we have put some parameters around those terms. And we have come up with sort of a conclusion that it looks like um, jellyfish are increasing in many places. Uh, It's definitely not all species everywhere, but when we look around the planet, we only have a a limited amount of data on jellyfish because they have historically been understudied. But when we examine, say, over the last 50 or 60 years, where we have data, where we can look at jellyfish population changes, we find a couple of important conclusions. One is that it does appear that jellyfish are increasing in many more coastal ecosystems than they're decreasing. So that gives us a sign that yes, something global is is going on here. As well, some of the places that we're really certain they've increased where the, the data is really strong to indicate there's more jellyfish around now than there were in previous decades, these areas are scattered all around the globe. So they're not necessarily Uh, directly connected or or right next to each other. So we're seeing increases in places like uh, Asia, you know, off the coast of China and Japan, Uh, but then, you know, certain areas around North America and the East Coast, even remote places like Alaska or Hawaii or Antarctica. So we have these sort of disparate spots all around the world that tell us you know what, if jellyfish are definitely increasing in all these different places, there could be some sort of global phenomena that's affecting them. So basically, from the data that we do have, it looks like jellyfish populations are indeed undergoing a global expansion, with regional variation, of course. With any generalization this large, there are always caveats. Like, we've never paid that much attention to jellyfish, so the more we look, naturally, we'll see more but there are good reasons to believe that this is happening. And that's because we, humans, are the primary driver of change in the ocean. <laughs> it's so funny that I say that. It's, like, it's because we, we, in case you needed a reminder, <laughs> humans. We, fellow humans. <laughs> it's like I'm posing as a human. <laughs> And that's because we humans are the primary driver of change in the oceans. And we know from observation that oceans and seas that are highly impacted by people are places where jellyfish populations can expand 
rapidly. There are certainly a range of things that humans are doing that are impacting the oceans negatively. And jellyfish react to these directly or indirectly. But in so many cases, things that we're doing are benefiting jellyfish. For example, when we overfish, jellyfish love this because fish are their predators and competitors. Well, you take away anything's predators and competitors, and it's going to do really well. I mean, that's just basic ecology. Ecology 101. Take away the predators and competitors. Woohoo! Field day, right? A more direct effect is warming water. Jellyfish love warming water. Warmer water, so any increase in temperature, as long as it's not too much. I mean, you could boil them, and that's bad for them. But, you know, just a little bit of an increase couple degrees kind of thing. You warm up the water a little bit, fish find it much harder to extract oxygen from the water because warmer water holds less dissolved oxygen. It's like us trying to breathe on Mount Everest. It's harder. We have to work harder. So fish do really, really poorly in warmer water, but jellyfish, they hit their renaissance in warmer water. Um, It amps up their metabolism. They grow faster They breed faster and more. They live longer. Summertime lasts longer for them. They love warmer water. We're seeing jellyfish increase their ranges and some increase their reproductive output. So we'll have certain species that that sort of thrive more in warmer waters. Of course, warmer waters isn't good for all species of jellyfish. If you have a cold water species that's, say, in the Arctic, that could be negatively affected by by warmer waters. But uh, we're certainly seeing these other more opportunistic species expand their ranges. And and even in Antarctica, one of the stories there has to do with global warming, where there's a decline in sea ice, which has resulted in uh, less habitat for, for krill, which need the sea ice for a, a certain part of their life cycle. And so that's increased the amount of habitat for salps, which is a kind of jellyfish that we find in the Southern Ocean. So even, even in a place as far away as Antarctica, we're seeing a real shift uh, in jellyfish populations due to global warming. Overfishing obviously benefits jellyfish. And warming water, receding sea ice, which is associated with global warming, is also going to boost most jellyfish populations. But what about that other major effect of global warming? Ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is another very interesting thing for jellyfish. So um, there is some recent research that demonstrates that they are affected negatively a little bit. But by the time jellies are affected, everything else is much more affected. And the same goes for various kinds of pollutants that we dump into the ocean. Pollution, you know what? They don't care. It doesn't bug them. They don't care. They're the last man standing when everything around them is dying. By the time ocean acidification or pollution gets bad enough to seriously affect jellyfish, everything else will be toast. Toast with jelly. So there's a certain type of pollution that I've become very fascinated with. Um, uh, Scientists call it eutrophication. It's just a fancy word for too much nutrients. We dump a lot of nutrients into the ocean, uh, whether it's from excess fertilizer. Runoff from farms. Or sewage or things like this ultimately sort of fertilizes the ocean. So you get these algae blooms. There's there's really dramatic algae blooms going on in uh, Florida right now, actually. I encourage the, the users to, uh, to Google it and check it out where um, all species in the in the marine environment are, are being affected with dramatic fish kills and things like this. So you get these algae blooms and eventually they'll they'll die and as they start to decompose, this uses up a lot of oxygen. As the bacteria are decomposing them, a lot of the oxygen will get used up. And it creates what we call dead zones, where every living thing dies, everything. And it, you know, it either results in extremely low oxygen or actually zero oxygen. Where it's low oxygen, pretty much only the worms survive. Where there's no oxygen, even the worms die. And it creates these moonscapes. It's just unbelievable. Jellyfish love this. That's their turf, man. They're good there. So what they do is they hang out in the oxygenated water near the top, you know, right at the surface. And then they go down and they can slurp up the gunk that's in these dead zones. And they store oxygen in their jelly, their tissues. And then they come back up when they get low on oxygen. They need more oxygen. They come up and recharge. (laughs) I mean, they're, they're like little rechargeable phones, you know? <laughs> and 
so, you know, but they go down there and they just like slurp, 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 slurp. You know, they, they get all this, you know, organic matter. Acidification, pollution, eutrophication. These are chemical changes to marine ecosystems. But there are also physical modifications. Like, for example, trawling, which is where a fishing boat will pull a giant weighted net that drags along the ocean floor to catch fish. Trawling is one of the best things that could ever happen to jellyfish. So when you trawl, you're actually dragging these heavy nets with, you know, chains and all this stuff, this heavy, heavy stuff. You're dragging along and you flatten the three-dimensional habitat. So all of the, you know, the corals that are sticking up and the sea pens that are sticking up, the macroalgae that are sticking up, wham, they're all raised to the ground. But what happens then is when that rock gets turned over, okay, that's now new fresh habitat for jellyfish larvae to settle and start growing more polyp colonies. And of course, with anything that's space limited, first on site gets the space. Well, jellyfish tend to be first on site. That's actually a link to sort of one of the last major factors, which is coastal development. And we think this is basically providing more habitat for those jellyfish polyps. Some species seem to prefer to be up underneath structures, probably to avoid too much sedimentation. But you can imagine the natural environment, there aren't a lot of overhanging structures, maybe some rocks or the underside of, of some of those uh, bivalve shells. But when humans develop a coastline, of course, there's a huge amount of shaded habitat. We have marinas, breakwaters, uh, oil rigs, aquaculture operations, net pens, all these things um, potentially creating more habitat for, for jellyfish polyps. And often when we go down with scuba equipment and just sort of inspect and, and look at what is growing on these structures, in, in many cases it's, it's jellyfish polyps. I've got to say, so far, this exploration of jellyfish is making me feel really evolutionarily inferior. I don't know how to say anything nice in response to that. <laughs> I was not jellyfishing for compliments there. Whoa! Oh my god. <laughs> we are incredibly delicate compared to them. You know, they can survive anything. Okay, maybe not a frying pan. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, look, there are some things they can't survive. But but even when the jellyfish itself dies, like a frying pan, right? You know, you run over it with your car. Okay, splat, no more jellyfish. You know, stranded up on the beach, high and dry, pst, no more jellyfish. But no, man, that's not it. Because they got those polyps. Don't forget the polyps, right? There's always more jellyfish because they got those polyps. And we haven't worked out any way to get rid of the polyps. So to sum it up, well, an individual jellyfish medusa might appear delicate. Jellyfish as a whole organism are virtually indestructible. And basically everything that people do to marine ecosystems benefits jellyfish, usually at the expense of fish and other more complex organisms. We're starting to see these effects all over the world. After the break, we'll take a closer look at what a jellyfish apocalypse might look like using a real world example. And we'll ask, what can we do? And what does it all mean? All after the break. Up to this point, we've been talking about an abstract jellyfish life cycle and the abstract human activities that are creating a very real increase in global jellyfish populations. But in the Black Sea, there is nothing abstract about any of this. A little geography here. The Black Sea is a huge inland sea in the Mediterranean, separating Eastern Europe from the Middle East and Western Asia. It's bordered by Ukraine to the north, Romania and Bulgaria to the west, Turkey to the south, and Russia and Georgia to the east. About a third of Europe drains directly into the Black Sea. It holds significant biodiversity, and historically, it supported a very productive fishery for the countries that ring it. Back in the 1970s, large amounts of fresh water was being diverted from rivers like the Danube that drain into the northern part of the Black Sea. This disrupted regional hydrological patterns and degraded formerly productive habitats. The water was used for irrigation and hydroelectricity for the most part. 
all this increased irrigation, coupled with new industrial methods of farming, led to a boom in agriculture in the north. The result? Excess nutrients pouring into the northern Black Sea, and leading to eutrophication. Finally, fishing was taking place on new industrial scales, leading to rapid declines in populations of previously abundant fish. And by the early 1980s, all of these pressures had already led to large blooms of native jellyfish species, like Aurelia orida, the moon jelly. But the other shoe was about to drop. As we transport all of our goods around the globe, um, sometimes creatures from the ocean come with it and in the form of ballast water in these big shipping tankers. And so um, we've seen jellyfish uh, from one part of the world pop up in another region where um, they certainly weren't native. And in some cases, they've exploded in population, probably because they haven't evolved with a natural predator there and they can really overtake an ecosystem. We saw this happen in the Black Sea where jellyfish were eating a lot of the fish eggs and fish larvae, and they really just took over the entire ecosystem. A number of invasive species were introduced to the Black Sea at the time, but the most consequential was a species called Nemeopsis lidii, also known as the sea walnut. It's a tenophore, which is a group of jellyfish more commonly referred to as comb jellies. These jellies don't pulse through the water like the medusae we're more familiar with. Instead, they use rows of cilia that run down their bodies. They glide deftly through the water. Nemeopsis is hermaphroditic. It's self-fertile and voracious, which makes it a potent invasive species. It's originally native to the Atlantic Ocean, but it's been introduced to many places, including the Black Sea. And once it arrived, it immediately took advantage of the declining fish populations and eutrophied conditions to explode in population, completely taking over in the course of just a few years. 1982 was the introduction, 1989 was the peak in population. In its heyday, 95% of all the biomass in the Black Sea, every living thing, 95% was this one species of invasive jellyfish. That's how much it had taken over. Yeah, it's just, like, it blows my mind. Every time I try to think of what that looks like, I just, I don't know, uh, my mind starts to implode or something. Like, I just can't go there. And, I mean, there was a perfect example of this sort of cascade of problems that ultimately led to complete flipping of the ecosystem. And in the Black Sea, nothing really ate these things. In the ocean, there are some species, like ocean sunfish and sea turtles, that do eat jellyfish. But in the Black Sea, Nemeopsis was, in effect, the apex predator. When we think about apex predators, we usually imagine lions, or bears, or ourselves. But in a jellyfied ecosystem, the lowly, brainless jellyfish can actually fill that role. You know, I learned the typical food chain that we all learn. You know, phytoplankton are eaten by grazers like copepods, you know, these tiny little crustaceans, and pretty much everything bigger than a copepod eats a copepod. And, you know, then small fish eat them, and then medium-sized fish eat them, and then large fish eat them, and so on, you know, and, and then we eat the fish, and, it, you know, that kind of thing. So the typical food chain that we all, you know, it's what we learn. And so this is now what's called the high energy food chain because there's a lot of energy that's transferred up the food chain and ultimately, you know, we require a high energy food source to sustain our own bodies. So there's a lot of energy being transferred up and being consumed. The low energy food chain, that's where jellyfish rule the world. So the top predator and we're talking the sharks, the humans, the whales, right? The top predator on the low energy food chain is jellyfish. It's not sharks, it's not humans, it's jellyfish. And so we don't really think of them as the top predator, but they are in their world. So the low energy food chain has a different type of phytoplankton, um, things called flagellates and microbes and things like that. And so that food chain, it's a shorter food chain, there's not as many steps, not as many, you know, this eats that, eats that, eats that kind of thing, right? Um, and jellyfish are the top predator. The funny thing about jellyfish, though, is even though they're the top predator in the low energy food chain, they're not stuck there. 
They're also, in many cases, the top predator in our food chain, the high energy food chain, because they sort of reach over with their tentacles, I'm getting a little metaphorical here, right? But they reach over with their tentacles and they rob food from the high energy food chain. You know, they're not gonna eat a shark, right? But jellyfish will eat the eggs and larvae of a fish and they'll also eat the plankton that the larvae would eat. So this double whammy of predation and competition can absolutely wipe out not only that fish population, but everything up food chain that relies on those fish. This, to me, is the crux of the problem. That once an ecosystem has flipped to being dominated by jellyfish, it might be, for all intents and purposes, impossible to flip it back. Lisa has referred to rapid jellyfish population expansions as a death rattle for a marine ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. So some of, the, well, most of the systems that we see that have flipped to being dominated by jellyfish they're incredibly resilient. You know, we always talk about resilient ecosystems, right? Yeah, you want resilience, <laughs> let it be dominated by jellyfish. That is resilient, that's not budging, that is not changing. I don't spend quite so much time thinking about what we can do with jellyfish ecosystems, you know, once they flipped. I'm really more concerned with how to identify before something is flipped and what can be done to keep it from flipping. So to save somebody before the death rattle. So, Mendel, you're a designer. What can we do about this? People have talked about kind of developing and, and growing human applications for jellyfish, and then those come in a, in a lot of pretty out-there forms. I mean, the obvious one is is eating them and, and creating this consumer demand for a new kind of food stream. Um there's things like mixing them into concrete so that the concrete flows better or, or using them as filters for, for nanoparticles. Um, I mean, industrial lubricants, that sort of thing. Right, which is kind of the, like, that's the best way we can think of to use capitalism <laughs> to sol- help us solve the problem of too many jellyfish, right? <laughs> like make a demand for them in yeah. some industrial capacity. Right, and and is that misplaced? Like if we start to create value for them, does that give us the right incentive to put our ecosystems back in the trajectory that we actually want them? Or does that just sort of excuse our current behavior? Jellyfish are eaten in several different cultures, and it's, it's not hard to imagine in the same way that sushi went from being, you know, disgusting raw fish in North America to being one of the most popular foods. It's still disgusting raw fish. It's all perspective, and it seems very reasonable to imagine that in in a decade everybody could be eating jellyfish but what happens when we start to really like it and so i think if um we adapt to fishing for jellyfish as sort of the new normal then um we might lose sight of what our ultimate goal is to potentially restore ecosystems marine areas to to what they potentially could be and so if we adapt too easily to that i think that um it could be a big reason that we would uh sort of stop doing the things that are potentially causing increases of jellyfish in the first place you know global warming invasive species overfishing it might give us an excuse to continue to do those things which which obviously isn't good i kind of doubt that though Mm mm-hmm because from what I understand, jellyfish is at best a suitable flavor carrier for other flavors. Like, I, it doesn't seem like it has much flavor on its own. And it's only certain species of jellyfish that are edible, mm-hmm. right? Definitely not all species of jellyfish are edible. Mm-hmm. And something we haven't talked about a whole lot in this episode, but something that Lisa spends a lot of time doing in her career in Tasmania, where she works, is protecting people from jellyfish stings during bloom situations and trying to predict blooms. Because, you know, n- newsflash, jellyfish are really dangerous. Some species are really dangerous. And even the not-so-dangerous species, they can still harm you. They can still sting you. Was it, I mean, it might also have been Lisa who was just talking about how some people are working on machines where the machine 
sails through the water and it has blades on it and it just chops up jellyfish. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. This is, I don't like that vibe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that, that, <laughs> just the jellyfish terminator. Yeah. That's not the, the kind of solution that I want to see. Right. right. If, like, if ecological restoration means deploying jellyfish terminators into the water, that's pretty, that's pretty far from the version of ecological restoration that I work within. So is there any hope then? Will the Black Sea forever be a sad pool of jelly? Well, actually, the, the Black Sea has made a partial recovery. And in a roundabout way, it proves Lucas's point that if we change the underlying patterns of human activity, then we can change the outcome. It's just that in the case of the Black Sea, we were forced to change the patterns. And the only reason that it kind of flipped back, and I'm putting that in air quotes, um, is because of a very, very strange and unexpected simultaneous happening of things that would never happen in a normal world. Like, I mean, I think they could just never happen again. And so because the fisheries collapsed, the fishermen stopped fishing. So strangely enough, this actually gave the fish a bit of a chance because the fishing pressure stopped. Simultaneously, um, Nemeopsis's primary predator, also itself an introduced species, was introduced in ballast water accidentally. And also at that same time, as the Soviet Union was breaking apart and having all kinds of political problems there, the subsidies, the, the fertilizer subsidies to the farmers stopped. And so the runoff of the fertilizers stopped because farmers were using less. And so the um, nutrients coming down into the water and creating this dead zone that slowed as well and so these three things that would never actually happen on purpose all happened at the same time the cost of doing those things on purpose would never make them possible I mean putting farmers out of business putting fishermen out of business introducing a species that you don't know what's going to happen it's still not enough it still hasn't gone back to what it used to be you know, and so I don't think the typical person is even aware that that kind of thing is happening, particularly in the ocean, because you know it's under the cloak of water. It's funny; people yeah. don't seem to do anything differently until it's totally dire. Yeah, yeah. And and like like Lisa said, jellyfish is already the death rattle. There's no guarantee that an ecosystem can come back after that. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who practices ecological restoration and, and studies it, that's the most terrifying thing when, when your ecosystem undergoes a a total threshold shift from a place where maybe you can bring it back to where it was or, or, or bring it to a place that's acceptable. I, I think this is one of those cases in which we can't really provide the hopeful forward thinking ending that we would like. Like no matter how much technical acuity that we bring to this problem or 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 how we shift our thinking, this is something that we're going to be dealing with. And it's just a question of how bad it gets. At the at the end of our interview, Lisa actually turned it around on me and she said, so someone your age, because I'm <clears throat> a little bit older than you. OK, <laughs> yeah, probably double, I'm guessing. But <laughs> from your point of view, um, are you angry that we've let it get like this? Are you angry that we didn't do something earlier? And I just told her I, I blame baby boomers for everything. <laughs> it's, ba- baby bloomers? It's really good Can we call them baby bloomers now? <laughs> yeah. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Please tell everybody that you know. Subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever podcasts can be found. It really helps us get the word out. In this episode, you heard Lisa Ann Gershwin and Lucas Bratz. This has been an independent production of Future Ecologies. Our first season is supported in part by the Vancouver Foundation. If you'd like to help us make the show, you can support us on Patreon. We have a whole series of mini-episodes profiling cool species of jellyfish with Dr. Gershwin. To get access to these, head to patreon.com slash futureecologies. 
You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and iNaturalist. The handle is always Future Ecologies. Special thanks to Karen Barnaby, Kirsty Johnston Monroe Cameron, Judy Homberger, Ilana Fenerev, and Diane. Music in this episode was produced by Speshpep, Radioactive Bishop, Turku, Nomads of the Silk Road, and Sunfish Moonlight. You can find a full list of musical credits, show notes, and links on our website, futureecologies.net. And this is a Speshpep Jam. Enjoy. Enjoy.